ahead and get started. I've got a lot to go over here. Um, starting with a reminder, the blessing of the backpacks, that's going to take place next Sunday for all students and uh, school personnel. So please make sure that your children bring their backpacks. Also next Sunday, we're going to try to have 100 or more in Sunday school. If you don't usually attend Sunday school, make an effort to visit a class next week and start a new tradition. Children and teens will start regular school next week, and this will be a great time for them to get involved in Bible study class along with their peers. Visitors, if you could, please stop by the round table in the foyer as you leave today to turn in your visitor card, as well as pick up a small gift from us. The offering today will be a monthly love offering for our pastor. Next Sunday's offering is, of course, going to go to missions. Um, a reminder, please turn in your completed family information sheet for our church directory to Sister Peggy Freeman. And a huge thank you from Sister Dana. Thanks to everyone who helped with the breakfast. We made $1,000. Praise God. That's a success. And also, thank you to all who worked at the car wash and those who came in or made donations. Um, thank you to Brother Barry and the Youth Department for hosting the Mountain Paradise out on Friday. Fun was had by all. It was refreshing. And then also, um, Operation Christmas Child is still needing small stuffed animals, some flip-flops, pencils, crayons, and loose-leaf notebook paper. So a reminder for that. And last but not least, if you've ordered a t-shirt or would like to have a Living Waters Tabernacle window decal, uh, please see Sister Darlene for that. Um, that's it for announcements and reminders. Let's go ahead and acknowledge our favorite part here. Do we have any summer babies, any birthdays being celebrated this past week or this coming week? If you could please stand for your blessing. Birthdays. Yay. Oh, there's one. Brother Tommy. And Brother Claude. Brother Claude. <laughs> Anybody else? You don't want to miss out. It's not to embarrass you. It's to celebrate you. No other takers. Well, all right. We got two over here. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Congratulations. Whether it's been a year, 20, 50, you name it. Any anniversary we've been celebrating this past week or this coming week, if you could please stand. No takers. All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to ask Sister Sandy to please come up. She's got an announcement. It has uh, given out that 90,000 pounds of food to 1,120 households, 3,103 individuals. Uh, so I think that is something that we can really be proud of. Um, and we could, have not, we could not have accomplished those things without the help of our volunteers. They are faithful, they're steadfast, they're dependable, and they're prayerful. Um, and those volunteers that have been with us every week are Clark and Julie, John.
Josh and Kayla, Theresa, Linda, Dale, Vicki, C.W., and Morgan. And we thank Keith and Darlene for having faith in us and Living Waters Tabernacle for this financial support. I have a couple of letters that people have um, given me, and I'd like to just share what this ministry, uh, a couple of things that they, um, that the pan pantry has done for them. But I want to tell how thankful I am for the food ministry. The people are so nice and caring. The food they provide is very helpful. While my husband was sick and I had to take care of him, there were times this is the only food he had in the house because I couldn't work. After he passed away, the people stood by and made sure I had food, and I thank God daily for the help I received. May God bless each one who has had a hand in the food ministry. Um, another one. The food pantry is a godsend for me and my children. I am a single mom who works for eight years. 725 an hour for 30 hours a week just to pay my bills and support my children. Without this food box, my children might not eat some days. I am very thankful for the food box and the people who work there to welcome you and give the food. Without the help, without the help with the food that I receive, I would have to either let my power bill lapse or cannot afford gas to go to work. I make $8 an hour before taxes, and I can't hardly live off of that. I really appreciate the help. I thank God for this place. I very much appreciate the people and the love and concern that they show to help those in need. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning to let you know what an impact that Pantry for Christ has had. And uh, I believe we can say that God has truly blessed the work of our hands. Walk around, shake hands with one another. The praise team, come on up.
Yes, we can see that your wonders are still. 
give him praise this
makes us think that the Lord has come this morning. Oh, 
of trouble and trial in the last days we told in the Bible. There is a promise of God on which we stand. Soon on a day when the least expected saints in the grave will be resurrected, we will rise and never be the same again. King Jesus is coming. This could be the day. He's waiting on something. He'll hear his father say. excited about that and all the wonderful things that are taking place in our youth department and our drama teams and, and uh, just get in here and get to be a part of it. But you can check us out at our website www.livingwaterstabernacle-cgma.com and also you can uh, watch our videos on YouTube now. Uh, we are on Instagram, Facebook, and you know all the social media outlets that we can get to um, trying to get the word out there that Jesus is coming to take his children home. Amen. And uh, so this morning, we want to uh, get you to turn with us to the book of Genesis, chapter 25. And uh, we're going to read about Jacob and Esau. And the Bible says that 
This is an account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. And before we go further, I want you to remember who Isaac was. Um, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was told by an angel of the Lord to take his son of promise, Isaac, up to offer him as a sacrifice. Remember that? Remember that? Yes. Come on, make sure you guys are awake. If you stay awake with me and if you amen me once in a while, let me know that you agree uh, or disagree, rather. Uh, this will go a whole lot quicker this morning. Um, kind of like getting ready to go to work. If we have to run around and keep waking the young ones up, it takes us longer to get there. Amen? Yeah. Everybody say amen, amen, yeah. Um, but I want you to remember that Abraham uh, was told once upon a time uh, to, op to offer his son of promise, Isaac, up as a sacrifice. And I want you to know that it was only to see his love for the Father, his actions for the Father. Was he willing to do what what the Lord had spoken to him, okay? It's not that God really wanted him to do it, but it was a test. It was a trial. So let's keep reading. It says, um, he was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of uh, Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other or wrestled with one another in the womb, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples uh, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter. The Bible goes on, it says that uh, Jacob stayed behind at the tents and uh, uh, developed a stronger relationship with his mother, while Isaac had a stronger relationship with his father. Um, he, he had a, a taste, Isaac had a, 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 wild, a taste for wild game, and uh, he loved Esau, but Rebekah, she really loved Jacob. And you can read on over about uh, how that transpired. I don't know how much of that we'll get into. But this past Thursday night, we had our uh, encounter with the young adults. And the Lord had impressed on me to share a word with them. And, and uh, how many of you remember what it was? What, what, what was the key word that we were focusing on? Huh? Entitled. And I went around to all of the young adults and I said, what do you think most people today in society think about the generation that are labeled millennials? And they started bringing out several things. Now, it depends on who you ask. The majority of the people in this room right now, I have some revelation knowledge for you. The majority of the people sitting in this room right now are considered millennials. Did you realize that? It's not just those in the 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It covers a much larger group than that. You have the baby boomers and then after that, depending on which statistics you're looking at, after that comes the millennials. So you figure it out where you fall in that line and which charts you want to go by. But I asked our young adults here at the church, I said, what do most people in society think about folks who are labeled as millennials? And that would be, you know, including their generation. And, and I, I heard words that I've heard thrown around from time to time. One word that I hear a lot is entitled. And then I hear a lot of folks from older generations who say, when I was a kid, we went through this hardship and we went through that hardship and we had to work hard for whatever we had. You know, we had to raise a garden if we wanted to eat. We had to, uh, 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 you know, I've seen my daddy walk so many miles to get to work back and forth. You know, I've heard those kinds of stories. And we appreciate that heritage about struggle. And we hear people say the struggle is real. And sometimes it is. 
And, and then we started going through generations of, of, of folks who, uh, you know, they wanted better for their kids. We always want better for our kids. We want, don't want our kids to have to struggle as, as um, hard as we did. And so we provide for them. And then we went through a time of, of uh, lack of discipline. Um, suddenly the church even started listening to what the world says uh, was proper parenting. And we allowed things such as um, correction to be taken out of the school system. And now, even in public school, they, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in public school system, Rebecca and some of y'all, um, in the public school system, they reward bad behavior to try to convince that child to uh, uh, have good behavior. I'm going to tell you something. That's an ignorant concept. That's an ignorant concept. That is a perverted concept. Yes, I said it. It's perversion. It's perversion of the truth. Because the truth is this. If you do the right thing, our Heavenly Father will openly reward you. Amen? And if you do the wrong thing, our Heavenly Father will openly chastise you. It happens. It happens. For us to try to reward someone for showing themselves, for us to try to uh, encourage a child for being bad by giving them whatever they want, what signal does that send to the other children? It sends a signal to them, I'll act out too so that I can get what she gets. I'll act out too so I can get what he gets. Listen, it does not work that way. What you are doing is setting them up for failure and you are almost guaranteeing them to spend 10 to 20 years locked up somewhere behind bars in the natural or I guarantee you 10 to 20 years locked up in some kind of spiritual bondage. He said, well, that sounds kind of harsh. It's time that we start talking straight. We have tiptoed with Tiny Tim through the tulips long enough. It's time that we stop it. It's time we stop it. So I looked up the word entitlement as I was talking to the young adults and, and on Thursday encounter. And, and I noticed that the words that they were throwing out there, what they said was that you know, they gave several descriptive words and every word that I heard come out of their mouth, if you are over eight, if you're between 18 and 30 in this church, would you stand up? Between 18 and 30. I want you to look around, church. Look at all these beautiful faces. Amen. Come on, let's give them a hand. Keep standing. Keep standing. Don't sit down here. <clears throat> These are the words that they used. That this is what they can I this is some of the things that they said that they think people feel about their generation. Lazy, entitled, tolerant. What else did John say? Unthankful, ungrateful. They went on and on and on and on. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, that's not what I see. Come on. That's not what I see. But to think that young adults in our church grow up thinking that that is what people think about them broke my heart. Now, they didn't say that's what they thought the church thought about them, but that's what they said they feel like the, you know, society thinks about their generation. And I told them, you guys can be seated, I told them, I said, what I'm hearing you say is that you feel like that society looks at your uh, demographic group and they see no hope. No hope for the future. I got news for society. If you're watching us and you don't know Jesus, I got some news for you. I got news for all of you, and I want you to go out and tell somebody that today, 
on August the 18th, 2019, that I said this. We have hope. We have hope. There's hope for a future, and it's looking brighter all the time. Come on. And there's hope for the church, and she's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I began to ponder on this after the I left. I had to go get some hay, so I had some time by myself. And I, I was riding down the road. And the Holy Spirit began to impress on me about entitled. Entitled. It actually has a very negative connotation on it the way most people use it. Amen? You are entitled to something. And I asked them a question. I said, what are some things that you're entitled to? And the things that they told me, you know, I was messing with them a little bit. You know, these weren't things they were really entitled to. It's things that they appreciated, but it's things that they expected because of the type of parenting that they had been subjected to. But not everybody's been subjected to the same kind of parenting. Amen? Not everybody has seen the same reflection. Amen? I wanted so bad to use your thing, but I didn't. It would have really helped me, Brother Barry. But I began to think about the word entitled. And I looked it up and it said, I want you to listen to this. It says, believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges. Believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges. Now listen, I want to point something out to you. We hear people say, I deserve death. When you were in sin, yes. But when you accepted Jesus into your heart, you are a recipient of life. It changes things. It changes things. Before Christ came into your heart, yes, you deserved death. And you had the death penalty applied to you. But when you accepted Jesus into your heart, you got a life sentence. But I'm not talking about a kind of life sentence behind bars. I'm talking about you have access and you are deserving and you are entitled to a life sentence of liberty and freedom. Hallelujah. And every promise and every blessing that God said, I'm going to give it to them. I'm going to give it to them. I began to study this thing out about Jacob and Esau and, and, and Esau actually had a birthright that was given to him because he was the oldest and it was a common thing that the oldest child or the oldest son that they would that the inheritance would be divided up like some of you that have several children the inheritance would be divided up but the oldest son would get a little extra so he would end up getting what is known as a double portion But Esau and uh, uh, Jacob, even in the womb, it says that they struggled. You see, God had a plan. Had a plan that the older brother's going to end up serving the younger brother. Jacob didn't want to wait on that. He didn't want to wait on God's time. Does that sound familiar to anybody? How many times have we gotten in a hurry? We get in a hurry and we start trying to push things. We start trying to make things happen. It's not that it's not God's plan, but we try to push things. Because we want what we want when we want it. We understand the birthright. We understand the new birthright even. As believers, we do the same thing. How many times since you've accepted Jesus into your heart has God spoken a word to you and you begin to push Him to make it happen? It wasn't that it wasn't the right thing. It was that it wasn't the right time. Amen. And you begin to push that's exactly what Jacob did. Am I right, Brother Rick? That's exactly what he did. And it says that Esau came out and, and it described him. And it says that he grew up to be a hunter. You know, and, and he could go out and, and his daddy loved the taste of wild meat. 
and he'd go out and he'd kill, you know, and, and he really prospered at that. He was talented and he was gifted at that. That was part of his birthright. It was part of his destiny. It was part of his calling. A lot of times you can tell uh, what a part of your calling is by the gifts and the talents that you have. Amen? But it says that Jacob reached up when they were being born and he grabbed a hold of his brother's heel. And because of that, his name was the deceiver. Any of you ever been deceived about anything? Has anybody ever told you one thing and then you found out the truth was completely opposite? Listen, in the natural world that we live, people will struggle and they will push and they will backstab and they will lie and they will manipulate to get what they want because there is this struggle to achieve something, to reach some point before they feel valuable. I'm going to tell you something this morning. A believer in Christ has no reason to ever give over to those kinds of behaviors because when you accept Jesus into your heart, you are entitled to all that the Father has. You have a new birthright. You are not subject to what you were before Jesus. You have access to everything after Jesus. It's exciting stuff. It's really good stuff. It goes on and it says that, that um, um, Isaac uh, loved uh, Esau because of the hunting thing. And, and Rebecca, she loved Jacob. And, and if you read on over a couple of chapters, it tells how you know they, they deceived uh, his father. But it, the Bible tells us that one day um, Esau was out hunting and he comes back and he's hungry. He's so hungry. He's just hungry as he can be. And he comes in and his brothers make some kind of soup, porridge kind of stuff, some kind of stew, and, and, and it just really smells good. And, you know, he was a chef. Good, good smelling stuff. And Esau comes in and he says, man, that smells good. Can I have some? Jack says, yeah, for your birthright, I'll sell it to you. You see, another thing about birthright is that that person that gets that double portion, not only do they get that, but there was also titles that often were associated with it, and there was also responsibility that was associated with it. Come on, somebody. Your new birthright, I'm going to tell you something, there are titles associated to it, and there is responsibility associated to it, Amen. attached to it. And it's, the Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. He said, fine. He said, what good is a birthright going to do me if I lay here and I starve to death? So fine, you can have it. I don't care. He sold what he was entitled to for a bowl of soup. A bowl of soup. You say, well, that sounds... How many of you, I want you to raise your hand. No, don't raise your hand. I don't want to know. How many of you, this morning, you said that sounds like the most stupid thing anybody could possibly do. That makes no sense whatsoever. How ridiculous is that? If the thought passed through your mind like that, I want to ask you this question. How many of us have ever sold our birthright for that next drink or for that next hit or to lay down with that next person or to go out and do this and go out and do that? Are we any different? Have we given up what we are entitled to to satisfy the flesh? Because that's exactly what was taking place. It's exactly what was happening. You see, he was concentrating so much on the temporal things and he was giving no thought to the eternal things. And don't we do the same thing? Oh, I'm going to... Listen, there are things that we can do to provide balance because the world's going to weigh on your mind, man. I'm not lying to you. 
the world's going to weigh on you, and it's going to pull at your heart, and it's going to, you know, it's hard. It's hard, but there's ways to find balance. One thing that we know that we can do is spend time with the Father. Amen? Amen. How many of us know that prayer changes things? Hallelujah. How many of us know that you can have a terrible day and you can pick up a word, the Word of God and you can read some inspirational something and it just turns things around like out of nowhere. And you're like, wow, all of a sudden I don't hate everybody. And all of a sudden I love everybody and life is good and I hear the birds chirping and I smell the flowers and everything's great. All because of one little word. How many of you know that you can be having a horrible day and you can be feeling really alone and then you can come to church and somebody comes up to you and says, man, I have missed you. I love you. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, you know, and you feel like, well, I actually matter to somebody. Amen. We know all these things. But how many times do we let those things go? Because the world's telling us you've got to be happy. You have every right to be happy. Go out here and do whatever you want to do with whoever you want to do it with. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We have used this baptism a lot. This baptism up here. Underneath this cloth, there's a big hole. And it's got steps on both sides in case you haven't been in it, if you haven't been up here to look at it. And I was thinking about how important it is and how exciting it is that people get baptized. It's a beautiful thing. Amen, church? And then how many of us know that it's a command? You know, it's for us to follow our salvation with baptism, which is an outward show of what has taken place in our life. That the old man has died and the new man is risen again. I'm going to tell you something. There are certain things that are expected of a Christian. And whenever we don't read, whenever we don't pray, when we don't spend time with the Father, when we don't come to church, coming to church is where you're going to be ministered to, where you're going to hear preaching, where you're going to see worship, where you get to fellowship with one another. Like it or not, it matters. It matters. It makes a difference. It makes a difference just like preaching the gospel. It makes a difference just like reading the word. It makes a difference just like singing and meditating on him and listening to the Holy Spirit. And it is an outward show for some that, hey, I'm a Christian. Because I'm a Christian, I want to be with God's people. The Bible tells us to have the mind of Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't do those things that we just talked about, it is absolutely impossible for you to have the mind of Christ. It will not happen. Come on. It will not happen. It will not happen. If you spend 80 hours a week at work and one hour a week at church, you're not going to have the mind of Christ. If you spend 50 hours a week at work and 20 hours a week on the ball field and one hour a week at church, you're not going to have the mind of Christ. You're just not. You're just not. It's not going to happen. And if you don't have the mind of Christ, Sister Dolores, we can get up and we can encourage and we can exhort. We can worship. We can welcome Him in. But you cannot expect carnality to be spiritual. And that's what happens. And I don't care who we are. I don't care how long we've been saved, how much we've preached, how much Word is in us. When you pour out, pour out, pour out, and you never take back in, you become empty vessels. And it's a scary thing. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Why are you talking about that? I'm trying to point something out to you. Esau despised his birthright. He knew that it would require responsibility. Sometimes 
even Christian people, even believers get to the place that it's almost as though they despise the responsibility of being a believer. Because I want to tell you something. You are responsible for some stuff. Every time somebody stands before you and joins the church, do I or do I not read to them in front of you and God and other witnesses that you will support the church financially and in attendance? Do I not say that? And every person, including those of us who are members of this fellowship, have we not said, I, I agree to do this? That's saying that I, I agree to be responsible. It's saying I'm covenanting, I'm making a covenant with you that I will be responsible to do what I'm agreeing to do. Why am I talking about this? Why? Here's the thing. When I left encounter the other night, I thought, God, this is what I heard. You are entitled to an encounter with the Father. You are entitled to an encounter with the Father. Let me read it this way. You are inherently deserving of the privileges of being in the presence of Almighty God. I thought, woo! Wow! That really sounds good. But here's the thing. I, get, I feel phone calls all the time. I get phone calls all the time. I have people call me, you know, pray for my son, pray for my daughter, pray for my husband, my wife. And we love to pray, amen. But here's the thing. This past week, I had a phone call, and this person, you know, they called me repeatedly, you know, praying for this person. And, 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 and so I finally asked, I told him, I said, you know, I'd like to see you Sunday morning in church. Oh, well, honey, I, I can't. And I said, well, how about so-and-so? Oh, well, they ain't going to church no more. Ain't going to church no more. So I said, well, how about this person I'm praying for? They going to church? No, honey, they ain't going to church nowhere. And then this came out of their mouth. But they're all saved. They're all saved. And they said, I can count on that. And I'm going to tell you, it angered me. It angered me that salvation had been diminished to an emotional experience without any responsibility to us as believers. And that's people across the world. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I say I got saved once upon a time and then bless the Lord, I go live like the devil if I want to, but praise God, I'm still saved. No, you're stupid. It's ignorance. And it will send you to hell. And people are dying and going to hell at an alarming rate. And what are we doing about it? You know what most pastors have to do? You know what most pastors, and I, I shared this Thursday night, do you know what most pastors spend the majority of their time doing? It's convincing the church what they are entitled to. Think about it. That's heavy. Most pastors spend the majority of their time trying to convince the church that they are entitled to the promises of God because by His grace, God said so. You have people who, who, who come and pray for me and I know what's going through their minds because
because I've been there and I've done it. We come up and it's like, okay, somebody anoint me and pray for me and I hope that this works. Come on. Come on. When's the last time you saw somebody come marching up and say, I want to be anointed and prayed for just because the word says so, but I know it's going to work because the word says so. And that's exactly what I'm expecting to happen right here, right now. Because I'm entitled to it, not because of my goodness, but I'm not who I used to be. I've had a new birth and I have a new inheritance. And I am entitled to the promises of God. I could go on and on with this. Temporary versus eternal. Psalms 16, verse 5 and 6 says, The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my life. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. just go do anything we want to do when we want to do it because this matters being here together matters spending time with God alone matters reading the word matters being sensitive to the Holy Spirit matters you can come up there and blast me all you want to after service it's not going to change what I'm preaching it ain't going to change the truth. You have an inheritance in Christ. The Bible says that we are joint heirs. Joint heirs. Joint heirs. We are jointly entitled to all that the Father has. Amen? Amen. And when the Bible says that we can be something, then praise God, guess what? We can be it. When the Bible says that we can do something, guess what? We can do it. When the Bible says that we can have something, guess what? We can have it. But we get bombarded by the world. And we get lied to by the master deceiver, our adversary, the devil. Listen, I could take any one of these kids. Come here, Mom. I could take little Molly. Now, I know how her mom and daddy love her. And, and you know, I know how precious she is to them. But I could take her away for a while and tell her over and over and over and over that her mommy and daddy don't love her. If you know what she would start to believe. She'd start to believe a lie. She'd start to believe that her mommy and daddy don't really love her. We know that's a lie. Brother Barry and Sister Beth, they thought a whole army for that little girl. But I'm going to say, come here, Molly. We're going to go do something fun. And she's going to put forth some effort to get over here to where I am. Because who doesn't want to have fun? Amen? We all want to have fun. It might be difficult. She might have to climb a few stairs. Come here, Molly. I've got something good for you. Chip a little bit more effort in there. The 
little more pep in her step. Look, I'm not even telling her to follow me now, but what's she doing? Listen, the world don't have to always entice you to follow them. You follow them long enough. I don't care how long you've been saved. You go chasing after the things of the world instead of chasing after the things of God. And sooner or later, you find yourself following after the world even when the world is not bidding you to come. Sooner or later, she'd start to believe that mom and dad don't love her. And when she started feeling like mom and dad didn't love her, and when she got away from the sanctuary and out from under the covering and she didn't think you guys loved her, guess what she'd be looking for? Somebody to love her. Is that what you want? Is that what you want to have? Then there's responsibility. There's responsibility that falls on you.
responsibility is nothing to scoff at. Every one of you that have a child in here this morning, every one of you that teach a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class, responsibility is nothing to scoff at and it's not something that you can just throw here and there. It's something to take seriously. You get one opportunity. You have that kid that visits. We have that church, that adult, that mom that visits. We get one opportunity to make an impression. We get one opportunity to say, hey, Peter, we are excited to have you. We are so thankful to have you. Please come back. Please. We get one chance. One. And if we miss it, It's here. 
healing that you need, this is where you receive. If it's provision, financial provision you need, come.
ought to end up a praise this morning. Come on. Worthy. Remember again, um, our visitor's table in the back. And uh, Sister Shelby will be back there. Just want to give our visitors a gift. If you wouldn't stop there and uh, fill out a visitor's card for any other announcements. Remember service tonight at 6 o'clock. Looking forward to being back in the house of the Lord. If you don't have something pressing you, I'm keeping you tonight. We want to invite each and every one of you to come back. Try to bring somebody with you. Invite somebody to come. God is good. Amen. Brother Rick, if he'll come up here and close us.